Cysteine kidney stones are one of the most difficult stone types to manage. But what do they even look like? And better yet, what can be done to manage or prevent these stones? If you're one of the unfortunate few who form this stone type, you're going to want to watch this video. Hi, I'm Joey Weichman, and welcome to Stone Relief. In today's video, we're going to wrap up our series on cysteine kidney stones. Specifically, we'll dig into the two different subtypes of this stone, what can be done to destroy them during passage, and the steps you can take to prevent them from forming. Now, if you haven't watched our video on cystinuria, you're going to want to add that to your watch list as it will help fill in some of the details that we won't get into in this video. Nevertheless though, let's begin with a brief background on this stone type. So cysteine stones represent about 1-2% to of all the kidney stones that are formed out there. And what this translates into is about 1 in every 7,000 individuals worldwide and about 1 in every 10,000 here in the U.S. will potentially have this particular type of kidney stone. Now, this particular stone type has a very high rate of recurrence. And we'll talk about why that is in just a second here, but about 83% of the individuals who have a cysteine stone at some point in time in their life, they're gonna get another one probably within a year or two. So this is the high rate of recurrence. And it is caused by a rare genetic disorder that's inherited that kind of screws with your body's ability to transport amino acids. Now, there are a whole host of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins that are involved in this potential malfunction, if you will, uh, that is linked to cystinuria. In particular, though, what we're looking for with cysteine stones is the amino acid cysteine. So this is a transport issue with the amino acid cysteine. Now, there are two different subtypes of this stone, and this is uh, not very well known. So let's talk about that for a second. So they look very different, <laughs> and that's the reason that it's not very much talked about because they are so drastically different, so far apart in terms of the way that they look that most people would not associate one with the other. Now, this stone that's on top, top here is the type, what we're going to call 5A, and again, that numbering and lettering structure is irrelevant outside of the stone relief community, but we're calling this the type 5A stone. Now, this is the most common type of kidney stone, uh, that is a cysteine stone, rather. Next, the type 5B stone is way less more common, and it looks way different, kind of yellow and glassy and kind of white and round. It almost looks like pea gravel, in my opinion. And as we get into the next chapters here, we're going to talk about the things that differentiate those things more. But the first place that we're going to start is with the most common one, the type 5A cysteine stone. We'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, as I'd mentioned, this is the type 5A cysteine stone. It is the most common type of cysteine stone. Now, it is going to be 10 times more frequent than the 5B stone, its sibling, which we'll talk about in the next chapter here. But um, the really interesting thing is that this has a kind of like a, a rough, almost glassy, crystally kind of surface to it. And the interesting thing about this is when I first looked at this stone type, I was looking at it going, oh, that's definitely got to be the weaker variety of these two stone, these two stone types, because one is weak and one is dense. And it's actually the opposite. This kind of fragile, glassy looking version of the cysteine stone is actually going to be the most dense of these two stone subtypes. Now, the range of density reported for the stone is pretty wide. It can be as low as 400 and as high as 800. So when you think about how to manage a stone like this while it's particular or potentially passing, you know, a product like uh, the one that I created called Cleanse to help me pass all of my kidney stones uh, could potentially work probably up until about 700 and 750 HU values when it comes to this stone type. So it's possible for you to destroy it, but there will be some stones that look like this that just won't be able to be touched uh, by a natural product like mine or even sometimes shockwave lithotripsy because some of these can actually get over 1,000 HU. And if you're not familiar with HU or Hounsfield units, we'll link a little card up on the top here that will talk about kidney stone density. It's a really, really important topic that you need to educate yourself on. But nevertheless, 1,000 HU is really, really dense. And again, probably beyond this point, uh, shockwave lithotripsy and uh, procedures such as that aren't really recommended for that by the American Urological Association because they're just not going to be able to be destroyed by something as intense as a shockwave lithotripter. So a natural product really won't even touch the surface of it. But for some of them, it's very possible. And when it comes to the cause, this is just straight up cystinuria. This is a breakdown of an amino acid transport that's happening on a cellular level in the kidney. And the basically what's happening is cysteine is just starting to collect in the kidney 
to the point where it starts to get super saturated. And once it's super saturated, meaning there's like a whole bunch of excess particles floating around in your kidney, they start to mingle together and bind, and then they start to form crystals that eventually aggregate and they start to look like this. In the next chapter, we'll talk about the 5B stub type, which again is driven by cystinuria, but there's another contributor that lends to its unique shape and then also its density as well. All right, welcome back. And I'd like to introduce you to the type 5B cysteine kidney stone. Now, just following us from this last chapter, this again looks really different than that glassy kind of yellow of the type 5A stone, which is the most common. Now, these stones typically form in multiples. And when I mean multiples, there's like several of them kind of forming together. Uh, you know, I mentioned pea gravel uh, back in the previous chapter, and I kind of think of it like a, a handful of pea gravel. And since they form in multiples, they get this unique smooth surface to them because the stones are kind of like rubbing up against each other and they're smoothing out everything that is occurring on that surface. Now, I'm not quite certain if they're starting off in that same yellow type of glassy configuration and then this friction and the fact that they form in multiples kind of wears it down to this whitish shape and maybe whitish slash slight yellow shape depending upon where in the stage of crystallization you hit it. Um, but nevertheless, they form in multiples and they're gonna rub up against each other and they're gonna end up looking like pea gravel. And if you pass some of these things, you're probably gonna pass a couple of them, not just one at a time. Now. The root of this, again, as I had mentioned, is cystinuria, but the reason for why you have this unique shape and then also the, the density that comes along with them is due to urinary stasis. And basically what this means is stagnant urine. You're not passing enough urine. And this could be either because you're not drinking enough water or maybe you've got some sort of an anatomical impediment, like maybe a goofy turn in your ureter or there's some sort of a narrowing that's occurring somewhere in the urinary tract that is preventing urine from passing as it normally would. A, a very, very common thing is like benign prostatic hyplasia, BPH, uh, where you're not able to express your bladder fully as you would if you had a healthy uh, prostate. So this potentially could be uh, something that is associated with if you have cystinuria. And again, they form multiples, they rub up against each other, and then they get this unique appearance. And it's my hypothesis that this friction that is occurring that gives them the shape and probably the color to a lesser extent of this particular subtype, the type 5B, it also lends to its weaker density because that friction kind of gnaws away at that stone. So unlike the type 5A stone, which is potentially very dense, 400 to 800 HU, these are much weaker, anywhere between 100 to 200 HU. And a product like the one that I created, Cleanse, can definitely destroy these uh, amongst a whole host of other things that can be done. But these are actually manageable while you're passing them. And they generally don't present much of an issue due to the smooth nature. They, they tend to flow through the urinary tract without a whole host of issues. But nevertheless, you can attack them with a product like Cleanse to be able to break them apart during passage or while they're still in the kidney if they get identified during a routine scan or something along those lines. Stick around for the last chapter where we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do to either slow down or actually prevent formation of cysteine kidney stones. Just a reminder, this information is available in written form on our website. Find the link below in the description. Lastly, I want to spend some time talking about what steps you can take to either slow down formation of cysteine stones or potentially even stop them altogether. Now, if you've watched the cystinuria uh, video that we've had, that's the precursor or the pre-video to this, this may be a little bit of a repeat. However, I think that the information is important to know because most doctors and most urologists are going to be sending people who have cystinuria down the wrong path, which is only going to potentially cause more kidney stones or cause another type of kidney stone, as we'll talk about here in a second. So hang with me here. Some of this is, uh, is going to fly in the face of modern medicine's advice, or maybe even what you've been told personally from a doctor or a urologist who's treating you for your cysteine stones. But at a foundation, proper hydration. And what I mean by this is a minimum of three liters of water consumed on a daily basis. And what this does for you, because <laughs> most people here drink more water and are like, ah, forget it. That's just useless advice. Right? It's too simple to be effective, but it actually does play a role because cysteine stones form when cysteine becomes super saturated in the kidney, meaning there are an excess amount of cysteine molecules floating around that then have the ability when given time to crystallize. So if you're drinking three liters of water a day, you're passing urine frequently enough to 
close the windows basically on super saturation's ability to crystallize these stone forming elements into actual stones themselves. So drinking water is actually super important. So don't skip on it. Next, urine neutralization. So cysteine stones really only form in acidic urine. They'll still form to a slower extent or lesser extent in like a pH of seven, but generally when you get above seven, crystallization is not occurring because the solubility or ability of cysteine to be dissolved in urine increases as your urine pH goes up or goes towards alkaline. However, there is an extent to this because if you go past seven and a half on the pH scale, you're going to set yourself up for calcium phosphate kidney stones. So don't do that. But urine neutralization is where it's all about. So anything and everything that you can do to keep your urine between seven, seven and a half, is a good thing. You can use urine test strips on a daily basis to kind of judge where you're at and then make adjustments to diet and lifestyle to be able to get you to where you need. Now, thiol-based drugs are another alternative that can be used here. And these drugs basically work a little bit like citrate works with calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate stones where, you know, the citrate binds with calcium and then takes it off the table to be bound with oxalate or phosphorus, uh, phosphate rather. Um, and in this instance, thiol basically binds with cysteine and then eliminates its ability to bind together very similarly in the kidney. So these can be effective. However, they come with their own host of negative side effects. So unless you're absolutely exhausted, all the other stuff we're talking about, I wouldn't encourage going down this direction because it does create additional problems outside of just kidney stones that are typically just best avoided. Now, lastly, and most controversially, we're going to talk about diet. And when it comes to diet, most of this all centers back in on urine pH, in particular urine pH neutralization. And a carnivore or an animal-based diet, which includes fruit and honey and you know um, dairy uh, as well to the level that you would be able to tolerate it, is a neutralizer of your urine. And when your urine is neutral, cysteine stones slow or stop forming. So that is a good thing. That is our goal. Whereas on the other sides of these coins, like the standard American diet, this is full of processed foods and seed oils and just pretty much junk that we shouldn't be eating. This is an acidifying type of diet, which makes sense. Like most Americans uh, suffer from sort of, sort of a metabolic disorder, which leads to acidic urine, which is why calcium oxalate kidney stones and uric acid kidney stones are the top two kidney stones here in the United States. Whereas on the other side of the coin where people are thinking, well, if acidic is bad, I'll just go the opposite direction. Well, a vegan or a vegetarian diet, which are super popular right now, and also probably what you've been recommended to eat by your doctor or your urologist for cystinuria, actually takes you the wrong direction because it takes you towards an alkaline urine pH, and alkaline urine pH sets you up for calcium phosphate stones. So being on either side of the pH spectrum is not a good thing. Your focus should be on urine neutralization, and the biggest lever that you can pull on is a diet that is made up of either completely meat and organs or an animal-based diet, which is predominantly animal like meats. And then you've got organs and then there's dairy, ripe fruit and honey that can be uh, constituted within an animal-based diet. And those are your most powerful levers for impacting urine neutralization. And when you add that to proper hydration, you can effectively slow down or completely eliminate cysteine kidney stone formation. Are you spending thousands of hours of surgery just to end up with another kidney stone a year later? Learn everything you need to know to say a big you to your kidney stones inside our free community at kidneystones.com.